Howdy folks. First things first. <laughs> the second half of the Wild Mother's Dulcimers on Piano Book. In the last video about this library, I mentioned that I would distribute that on my own, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is that it's massive. <laughs> the entirety of the library would be something around, I think, 14 gigs. And for a piano book library, that's, that's crazy. Um, and also, it's 14 gigs of work. Uh, this took a lot of work. I want to say something like 170 minutes of just raw recording time. The numbers on the timeline started to get really funny to see. Um, and then of course a lot of editing and a lot of uh, time building the GUI. I think you get it. So I liked the idea of making a couple of bucks for that, but I also really like the spirit of Piano Book and the idea that there is very little barrier to entry. Especially after seeing so much of the Blender community as I've gotten more and more individual effects the willingness to share in that community is just, it just kind of shattered my understanding of the way an industry could work. So I guess that just, hey there, just gonna interrupt myself real quick. Uh, got over that cold, hello. But my past self was just about to go through a spiel about Ko-Fi and how that's an awesome way to support me and it doesn't require that I put up any paywalls. Lo and behold, in the time between recording that video and now recording this video, Piano Book has introduced tipping on the website. Still goes through Ko-Fi, so my point remains identical, but I at least wanted to just touch on the current events. And I also wanted to touch on this because this is a decision that I really believe in, and I will champion as loud as I can. I know for certain I am not the only person on Piano Book who's dumping a lot of time and effort into building their sample libraries. It was hundreds of hours to build the dulcimer. And I think lightly I can speak for the other creators, the other samplists, when I say that I love the idea that if someone tries out a library and they really dig it and they have expendable income, they can go and reward that effort. For those who are not lucky enough to have that expendable income, they're not omitted from this. They're not excluded from the party. They can still have access to these libraries. And that feels so right as someone who is made to feel kind of sickly when they think about commerce. I know that everyone else is like that too. But with that said, please, if you have expendable income and you really dig what I'm doing and what the rest of the samplists on Piano Book are doing, uh, send some support, send some love. It would just mean the world to know that people are digging this and they think it's worth something. Uh, let's jump into the way I'm using the Wild Mother's Dulcimer in the context of a piece. I'm not necessarily writing this piece as a way to spotlight the dulcimer. Uh, I'm trying to put it in a bigger context, uh, big in two ways. Big in terms of the, the ensemble, it's just one part of many. And then also big in the sense that this eventually arrives at this huge epic section. Spoilers. Um, but yeah, it was my intention to just run the gambit for this piece, start out with some nice, intimate, really nuanced, almost like ambient, drifty stuff, and then put it kind of out of its comfort zone, somewhere where you wouldn't think to use this charming, woodsy dulcimer, uh, and see how I could finagle that and make it work. Uh, yeah, just kind of a quick piece, tried to sketch together, so I guess now you know what to expect. Uh, sadly, it will not be me greeting you on the other side, it will be Past Hunter, the low energy and very groggy version of me, I'm sorry to say, but uh, see you on the other side. <laughs>
The start of this piece is the ecosystem that the dulcimer, this one specifically, uh, thrives in best, which is the lush and the shimmering. I've found that uh, this library, specifically the 10 billion butterflies patch, finds a pretty great kinship with the Olafur Arnold's Chamber Strings Library. In this case, it's the Soltasto Pulse, and for the 10 billion butterflies, the close mic, gone, uh, and just the room and hallway mics, and then I have those panned pretty hard left and right. That feels like it sits with the string ensemble a little bit more naturally. It feels like it kind of envelops them uh, rather than jutting out into the center. Let's give a listen to what that sounds like. Yeah, so we have the trembling and shuddering of the um, dulcimer, but we have that thick gauze of the strings uh, working kind of to build some really healthy harmony. Okay, right below here, I think this could almost this could almost be a, a demo piece for the woven string library by um, Mr. John Meyer. But uh, take a listen to this. Uh, he has a whole video about it. I won't do too much explaining. Um, I will absolutely link that video. I've got that kind of sparsely layered into the string ensemble. Um, up above, uh, I have an area dedicated to just the dulcimer patches. If we're to listen to just what's going on there, um, it'll give you a kind of an idea of where a lot of the dulcimer uh, texture in this piece is coming from, uh, as well as what I think is sort of the superpower of this library, which is texture building. Um, in that part particularly, uh, this is this is an instance where if we just had our little arpeggio, it sounds a little stiff and lame to me. The real magic comes from the overlay right here of cedar splatter paint. I've essentially built that same descending pattern, but I've extended the notes so that they sustain, and I have them swell in a bit. It's almost kind of like an impossible delay effect. Uh, further on, we have a, an example of how I'm attempting to use the dulcimer in a way that cuts through the mix and, and can be used as, an, a, as a, a bit of a grittier sustained instrument uh, that goes along with our lead lines, that something that a trumpet or a horn or a violin might carry. Uh, but that's kind of a tall order. When an ensemble gets really loud, um, something like a dulcimer, in order to be heard naturally, you're just going to have to thwack that thing. And obviously the sound of thwacking a dulcimer isn't necessarily what you want, uh, especially if you're trying to speak out a uh, longer melody line. So a little bit of mutation has to occur in order to achieve that. In the uh, track that I've lovingly named Branches of Light, we've got this sound. And then in context, though slightly buried by the more prominent powerful instruments, the texture remains, which is fairly crucial to me because at the tail end of this melodic statement, we have the plucked elements of the dulcimer coming back. When those begin to restate at the end, leading us out, uh, it's nice that that texture never completely left our minds um, or our ears. those plucks um, that are, are kind of being properly greeted now. Let's hop on over to the kind of the mighty stampeding section of this. This is where we can rely on a dulcimer's thwack and call on a, a bit of its more um, abrasive and energetic side. Right, uh, so 
<laughs> amidst all of the, the thundering, uh, there is some sparkling. The plucked and the hammered patches are sort of our yin and yang. Uh, they were sampled and laid out the same way and share in common just about everything except for um, the means in which the sound was produced. The plucked are obviously plucked uh, with my fingers. I, I chose not to do the back side of the mallet, which is just wood. Um, I think I've heard enough of that, and I also don't find myself using it a lot. Even though it cuts beautifully through the mix, I always kind of wished it wasn't as um, razor thin. So I want to say that this plucked patch is kind of my answer to that. Um, because you do hear that little that little moment of grip right before the note is released into the air. The way that it cuts is crucial, but then the way that it's combined later is also crucial. So let's hear it by itself. So in our little ostinato repetitive stuff, even then it doesn't feel too machine gunny. There's just enough rough randomness to the way that my fingers had to move across the string. You feel a bit of like a brushing effect, a little bit of motion implied. So if we were to listen to just an excerpt of the hammered version of this, uh, you can hear that there's a little bit less kind of like hairy, scraggly business going on. Um, but it is a lot more uh, solid and kind of rooted in its tonality. So if we combine these two, you get a sound that both cuts and sits. Um, there's plenty there to catch the ear, let you know that a dulcimer is involved with uh, this chugging ostinato, but um, it also still sings out. Um, it's not only just catching your ears with the, the highest, most brittle parts of the sound, which is often the problem uh, with instruments that tend to cut. Um, uh, they really do. They cut, but they also slash. Uh, another thing you can do to elicit that kind of sense of singing out and cutting through, um, which I've done in parts of this line, are after doubling the part, moving one of them up an octave, in this case, the hammered. Uh, so right here you can see the faded green midi notes are the plucked and the darker ones are the hammered ones um, and together gel quite nicely uh, to the point where it's and, and this is really this is the trick isn't it it's it's that you're you're just adding it's a pure additive process just providing a little bit more strength to the overtone series that when you arrive at that multiplicative stage, uh, that that second iteration of the fundamental, uh, it's far stronger than it would have been. And uh, if you if you kind of massage that, you can almost get the sound to be uh, unified. Uh, you don't hear two things doubled. You, you just hear one deeply resonant sound. And so these little statements uh, that are being made by the hammered and plucked one octave apart from each other sort of feathers itself out into the glimmering cedar splatter paint and the Olafur Arnold's strings. Uh, this is something that I know I mentioned in the other video about the dulcimer, but the ability to blend these more standard hammered and plucked patches with the uh, aleatoric playing, this kind of like pattern-based performance patches. If it wasn't apparent to you, like that is a that is a secret weapon for this library, is combining these two gives you the ability to perform things um, in a really controlled manner and then blend in something that would be otherwise impossible to program, um, breathing just infinite life into the parts that you're performing and playing, designing, composing. And there you have it. I think that's just about enough rambling for, for this little sketch. So if you haven't done so already, please head on over to Piano Book, check this thing out. Um, the patches included in this next installment here are the plucked patch, uh, cedar splatter paint in meadow chimes, which are kind of textural, pointillistic, plucky stuff. Uh, the woodpecker, which is uh, a little percussion patch, real simple, but taps and, and hits on the body of the dulcimer. Bowed tremolo, and that might be it if I'm remembering correctly. Thank you for sticking around to the end of this video. Hope you got something out of it. Maybe you got a whole new dulcimer library out of it. And I'll see you next time.